Hey, welcome to Off Planet TV. I'm Randy Moggins, and uh, I have a really, really great conversation to share with you all tonight. Um, this is going to be very, white, very much white, white knuckle ride, freestyle kind of show. Um, I have with me in another room. You'll see in a moment um, two people that many people would describe as quote survivors of MK Ultra. I would call them prevailers. I would say that the two gentlemen we're going to talk to tonight are living proof that they, them, the cabal, however you want to define them, are not winning. And that um, what is coming out energetically right now, what is coming out in terms of information, and what is coming out in terms of the people who have decided they're not going to play by the rules anymore, is an indication of the winds that have shifted. Not just here in the United States and Trump of America either. I'm talking about the world. I'm talking about things that are shifting, not because somebody went and pulled a lever for somebody, but because it's time to do it. And um, I want to welcome two gentlemen with me um, on the screen to our left. And just raise up your hand is John Storm. That's John Storm there, okay, and Medicine Bear. And guys, you're in the same room. This is kind of an unusual situation. You've got a nice environment there. And um, so what we're going to kind of do is just we're going to unwrap whatever you want to unwrap tonight. Um, Bear, you're the least known of us publicly, although, you know, we're, we're brothers and we've been talking and we've, we've gotten to know each other at a distance. But maybe to start off tonight, tell people a little bit about yourself, your journey, where you've been, where you've come from, and how you and John Storm, of all people, wind up in the same room together. It's awesome. <laughs> well, uh, in a nutshell, it, it started out like it starts out with like most of us uh, adopted at birth, um, adopted into a family of what I've come to find is um, full of dark magic, um, ritual, ritual abuse, um, satanic worshiping, um, and a term that has come to, come to light that, we, that is pretty uniform for all of us is uh, the chosen one. You know, the, the, I, was, I was a chosen child for for all things dark and ugly, and um, my earliest memories are probably around age five or six. Uh, my designator, for those that it, it may help, is uh, Delta Bravo 567, uh, and that's what I was known as. Delta being the program identifier, Bravo being the group that I was associated with, and the number is a nomenclature for my place in a group of about a thousand children. And uh, the attrition rate for, for that particular group was extremely high. I don't know how many of the children made it, 
Um, I don't know how many are still active. I don't know how many are wherever they're at at this point. Um, what I do know is that I'm sitting here today. Uh, and it's it's been a difficult journey to get to where I'm at. It's uh, been heartbreaking. It's been gut-wrenching. It's been tearing down a lot of walls. And uh, thankfully, I've got people around me that I can count on to, get to go to that have a lot more experience diving into this and going down a rabbit hole. First and foremost, a brother of mine that I love dearly, uh, Duncan O'Finnan, and his beautiful wife, Susan, uh, were there when I really needed them the most. Uh, interesting the way that that whole dynamic has worked out over the years because we've gone back and forth in several conversations and, and, and talking over coffee and that relationship actually started, I believe it was 1987, 88, between Duncan and I. Uh, I was on mission in the Middle East and he was in a black helicopter providing um, overwatch and, uh, how should I say it, gun support. And uh, that's kind of where that started. As far as the relationship between John Storm and I, that has developed over the course of a period of time. Um, and it started out with us being put in contact basically th through Duncan and uh, we started communicating on our own and things have taken a turn the way that they, they always do and things came to light and, and steps needed to be taken to ensure the well-being and safety for, for storms so uh, things being what they are we stepped in and here he is with us now uh, and we're all living together and uh, taking one day at a time the best that we can um, um, as far as my history goes, I've got a long history of military service, damn near 20 years, five deployments that I can talk about openly, several deployments that I can't talk about because they're still, they're still behind, the, behind the curtain and uh, that exposes me to litigation that I'm not prepared to combat right now. But uh, as things start to unfold and, and the veil starts to drop more, those things I'll get into regardless, and uh, I'm willing to pay the consequence, whatever that consequence may be at this point. And, um, so let me ask you this. In addition to the fact that you were obviously part of covert operations, black operations, were you also what we would consider to be regular military as well, or were all your missions and all the work that you did under undercover? Not, it's... Not, it started out initially uh, as a cover going in, uh, went in with the birth name that was given to me, um, which is on my falsified birth certificate, which I can prove. Um, did a long stint and I've got a period of absence from military service. And my, my actual military records, if you put it all together, puts me in and out with a total of six and a half years of active duty when in fact I've got closer to 20. And uh, that's just sort of the way that plays out. Okay, and the reason I ask you that is because what we now know and, and in the time that I've spent doing this talking to different people who have come from programs is that not everybody's background is the same. Duncan has been hit very hard by people who have tried to find his military records even though Duncan has publicly stated repeatedly, I was never part of the military. Duncan was taken as a child, pulled directly into ultra, and never enlisted or formally part of any military units, but in fact served in other capacities. So it's, it's, I'm trying to fill in the background because like I said, everybody's story is different. There are different, there are different programs, different sub-programs, and, and different profiles to the way people are brought in and out of the programs. So go ahead, please. Well, uh, on that front, I've got the documentation for your listeners and viewers that uh, um, not a problem. I can provide that documentation that proves it. Yes, I did in fact serve. Um, 
Unfortunately, it's not going to be a complete file for various reasons. Some of that is under falls under the you know the uh, black category. Um, yes, I was part of covert operations. Yes, I did in fact work for, for this government and other capacities, well in, in the military in the military type capacity. Um, work for all those fun acronyms that we can. You know, leave it at that. Uh, Spectral Intelligence Agency had extensive interactions with, and uh, you know, that's where this all started. And of course, it came full circle for me. Um, the whole MK Ultra reality is not something that I wanted to be truth. I wanted it to be. Complete lie. I did not want to believe that this was possible, mm -hmm. that I could possibly have been involved in something so horrendous and horrific. Unfortunately, it's come my attention over a period of a lot of years so far of digging into the family background and, and finding out who these people were that I was adopted to, what their associations were with the Illuminati, what their associations were with the Satanic Church. Um, and this is the reality. This is this is the end result. Uh, again, you know, like I said, the term I heard the most growing up was "You're the chosen one. You're the chosen one." And uh, the the level of abuse that I was exposed to was horrendous. Very, you know, the first sexual experience I had was with my adoptive sibling, uh, and it was forced upon me. I was used in bloodletting ceremonies. Um, locked in cages, locked in rooms, beaten, electrocuted, uh, expensive background with the chair, uh, the programs, electrocutions, um, and all, all these things were meant to break my psyche down so that I would split off, my personality would split off so I could be utilized in other ways and compartmentalized. And uh, to that degree, for a period of time, they were very successful. I was a good operator and I was good at the job I did and I was trained to do one thing, one thing only, which was mm -hmm. to eliminate the threat and whatever that threat may be deemed by the powers that be. And uh, as a direct result, I lived with the nightmares that no matter what the programming is, has been, you can't take away what has happened. You can't, you can't erase the experiences, they're there locked away, <coughs> hidden behind locked doors. And over a period of years, I've been able to break down a lot of those doors and I've still got a long way to go. There's a lot of things that I can't put in place. I can't give you dates. I can't give you times. Uh, just recently, I've been able, with the help of, of John Storm, to be able to piece together one location early on in life, which we, we now know was a place where MK Ultra was in full swing for a lot of years on the East Coast, a place called Camp Hero. Um, I've got a photograph somewhere where I can I'm photographed with my adoptive father in uniform in front of this location. And uh, in, it, it, it's, it's things like this, it, you have to piece together and it takes a lot of due diligence to do the homework to get the information. And unfortunately, the way that these programs are designed, the way these people do things, actual dates and actual documentation isn't always there. I, I've got at my disposal, I've got records of MRIs that show the implants, left, one behind the left ear, um, one that was in the back of my neck. I've got a little glass jar in, in the garage that uh, if need be, I'll try and dig that thing up and, and make it available. Um, but I've got proof, but limited proof. Uh, I don't know where else you'd like me to fill in, Randy, as far as. Well, no, history. and the, the, one oh, thing, I, the one thing I know is that a linear narrative to me usually is a tell that, that the story is not true because of the way that memories are laced in and because of the way that mind control works, you're generally left with a nonlinear narrative 
and you're generally left with a lot of missing time, a lot of memories that don't make sense. It's basically the classic puzzle palace. So, you know, I, I think for this show and for my listeners, we're not looking, the authentication is the sound of your voice right now and your experiences. And, you know, I, I, I want you to feel as comfortable as you can feel given the subject that we're talking about. Because again, you know, anybody that comes out publicly and discloses this kind of information brings to the, brings to the theater another piece of the puzzle. And, you know, I, I think it's interesting that long ago when I started looking into this matter, you know, I got, I started talking to Duncan and even in those early years, and we're going back now almost seven years, um, the number of people that I've talked to, the many of whom have never disclosed, many of whom have never done this type of interview format, but have given corroborative evidence, both for very specific things, such as what Duncan was talking about, as well as pieces of the puzzle further down the road. So, you know, for the listeners out there, they kind of know this, they get it. Um, and, and so the picture is, that you're, you're building is your narrative and your ability to kind of bring to the table what you've gleaned from it. When did, when did you first start to get more clarity about this in terms of memories that came back and you could not push them away anymore? You had to deal with them. Or was that an ongoing part of the process? That started to happen to me August of 2003. June of 2003, I was in the Middle East uh, on active duty in operations in, in support of Operation Desert Storm and Desert Eagle. Um, our convoy was hit with an IED and uh, RPG fire and I was blown 150 feet out, out of the vehicle that I was riding in, and uh, as a result, got a classic, what they have classified now as a, as a brain injury. Um, and I was no longer able to perform the duties for which I was there for, so I was met back out into Rammstein Air Base in, in Germany. I spent, I came in with 57 people, other soldiers, and was segregated off by myself immediately with no contact with anybody except for the doctor and nurse that would come in and do blood work on me and do testing on me. Went through a three-month-long three debriefing where, again, I didn't have any exposure to anybody else while I was at Rammstein. Uh, and then when I was finally allowed to be out, I was allowed to come back to the United States. Um, it took me up to Fort Lewis, Washington, where I spent an additional 18 months fighting for my ability to come home. It took uh, all together from the time I was injured to the time I was actually seeing my family, uh, right around 22 months before they even knew where I was and how I was doing it exactly. Uh, they, a, friend of, a friend of mine did get word to my, to my wife at the time um, that I had been injured where I was at. And uh, like I said, it took about 22 months before she and I actually had contact. And I, I came home and it was about, yeah, about a, about, a, about a year, year and two months later. So it was August of the following year, 2004, when the headaches started getting really bad, the ringing in the ear started getting really bad. And the only thing that I could do was sit there and write about what was going on. And as I was writing, all these memories would start coming in, you know, where I'd been, then I couldn't, I couldn't associate, okay, well, this doesn't make any sense. I know I was here, but the dates don't match up. I know I was there, but the dates don't match up. But wait a minute, I should have been early childhood. I was, no, I was at camp such and such. No, I wasn't there. Turns out I was over at Camp Hero on the other side of the United States during a period of time. I thought I was gone for three days. I was gone for three months. Uh, and this is the type of thing that was snowballing on me. And for me, I started reaching out, trying to look in, okay, well, what can be the cause and effect of this? And started doing my own research in the library. Of course, we had the internet, so I was using the internet. And 
managed to stumble across people like John Storm, Duncan O'Finian, the Awake and Aware people. I started looking into that. It's like, well, this is interesting. And I started to be able to relate to it. And then when Duncan and I were, uh, actually before that, I was living in California. I had moved from California after my divorce in Nevada and found myself in this little place where a lot of us find ourselves in, which is called Trump, Nevada. And if anybody knows, Trump, Nevada is well known for uh, ex operators that live there. And while I was there, I had walked into this computer store, taken my computer in. Unbeknownst to me, the individual that was running the computer store, uh, you'll recognize the name as soon as I bring him up. Yeah. But I walked in the door, and the, the interaction immediately was this cold, dead stare back at me. And what do you want? What are you here for? And the interaction was not pleasant. And the individual that I, that I wound up interacting with was uh, David Corso. David Corso, yeah. And David, yeah. David initially was the one that was there for me to help me start dealing and breaking things down more. So it was, mm -hmm. God, 2010 or so before I actually was able to start diving into meat and potatoes of what I had been through and how and why and all that kind of thing. So it, it, there's a, there's a lapse of time from when things started happening to when I was actually start being able to start piecing things together and associating what I had been through is actually being MK ultra mm. programs, project Delta. Um, and those who don't know what project Delta is, that's a whole nother program in and of itself that we can go into it another time. But in a nutshell, it's the assassination program. It's what took place after Vietnam, an offshoot of Project Phoenix, the Phoenix Project, and it's all about assassination. That's all that program is about. That's what you're trained for, that's what your job is, in whatever capacity they need it to be, be it up close and personal, half a mile away, whatever whatever the job requires, that's what you do. Um, but where it started, like I said, it was back in 2010 when David Corso was still had his computer shop down in front. And uh, initially, the, the contact was horrible. Uh, we didn't get along. Uh, he, he, told me, he told me shortly after that, after that, I know each other a little bit, but when you walked in my shop, I wanted to kill you. Yeah. My first thing was just to kill you. And uh, we wound up becoming really, really good friends. And, got to hang out with his wolf dogs and, and be at his property. The, the interesting thing about that, that Duncan and I have gone back and forth with this particular thing and have never became, gotten a good answer. Uh, for whatever reason, I'd be leaving David's house, Duncan would be driving down the street, going to David's house, and we were never there at the same time. We passed each other on the same, same dirt road, coming to and from, but we're never allowed to be, for whatever reason, David right. just didn't want the compartmentalization, right. The, 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 this is something that I've heard a lot from other people who have been in projects, including White Wolf on Attic, and who explained a lot of that in an interview I did with him um, about the fact that, you know, it's uncanny. But basically what White Wolf told me was, hey, you know, I run into you in the back alley somewhere. You're part of my program. I only have two choices. I either let you kill me or I kill you. And, you know, I, I guess in a way you kind of view that the encounter with Dave went the way it did because of where Dave was in his own process at the time. Um, and and that's, that's part of this as well. It seems like, and John, kick in on this, is it largely a function of trauma that... Like Duncan had his car accident, Bear has had this head trauma. Are we talking about trauma as a gateway to open up the memories, or do they break down over time as as just a consequence of age? No, I, that's a well, actually, that's an interesting point you make because um, they found out there's all kinds of things that trigger your memories. Uh, and the thing about, like I say, when you, you get into the traumatic the, the PTSD. There's the saying, you're never more alive than when you're like this close to death, all right? Mm -hmm. Everything, the adrenaline's pumping, 
your bioelectric, I mean, you're thinking and moving faster and stronger and quicker and everything else like that. But everything you're experiencing on that battlefield or whatever that situation is that you're in, is being ingrained permanently. It's like being burned on your hard drive indelibly. All right, every smell, every sound, every taste, uh, every sight, you know, it, it's the difference between a bad day at the office and, 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 and PTSD is the bad day at the office, you can come home and you can talk about it, you can get it off your chest and it's pretty much forgotten. This, you can close your eyes and try to go to sleep 25 years later and you're gonna still see it. Now the, now the thing is, it ties in with this, when we were talking about the trauma, things like a snatch of a song, will remind you instantly of a particular time and place. It's just, it's as if your mind is assigned it. A smell like strawberries mm. or, 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 or musk will draw, will just bring out. I mean, it'll come back to you vividly, certain memories. Okay, so after you've been through this much torture, trauma, fighting, and, and all the kinds of styles of injuries and everything that I've, I've gone through, if you got something that sounds a little familiar, uh, it automatically triggers that whole schmear. I remember shortly after I, I uh, left MK Ultra in 78, I got a job at Marine Midland Bank in Rochester up on the first, fifth floor data processing, you know, or suit to work, that kind of nice stuff. Mm -hmm. so, uh, and I'm coming, coming through the, the this, is, this is a big story, down, uh, uh, building downtown and I come through the mall, come out to the front to catch a bus to, to go home after work. All of a sudden a truck backfires. Big blank. Here I am in my three piece suit. There's no thinking about it. Okay. No thinking about it. Blam. I'm in on my belly in the lowest spot that I could find in the street, which was the gutter. <laughs> Peeking over the gutter trying to see where the bang come from. People are looking at me like, oh, Jesus, he's got to be one of those Vietnam vets. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, Jesus, if that was what I thought it was, I'd be the only one that survived on this block. <laughs> you know, but, but you see how the memory kind of kind of goes, triggers that little reptilian part, and then shit starts happening. There's a chemistry that kind of gets started, and it starts nagging. Where'd that come from? You know, this is not like me. This is not like the choices I'm making now. This seems like somebody else, but I remember it vividly. And uh, me, I kind of come through the decades pulling little bits and snatches. However, where I was in Rochester, New York, was kind of like MK Ultra Central. Yeah, it is. And I've spent time in Rochester. I'm. <laughs> yeah, there's yeah. yeah well, uh, uh, Sidney Gottlieb, uh, uh, George Estabrooks. He's from there, mm -hmm. called Rochester. He, uh, he, he got his doctorate there. Louis Julian West is one of his protégés. Uh, um, I got my, my theology doctorate in, in Colgate. Uh, um, uh, but I mean, all of those institutions are there. You can say, what do you remember? Uh, I think in my case, a lot of things fell apart at a, a, at a bit earlier. And some things, maybe they weren't as good at doing it then as they are now. Uh, obviously, there are more decades experienced putting this stuff together, but some stuff didn't stick. Uh, you know, the manipulation and stuff like that to get me to do the things that, uh, 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 that they wanted me to do. I don't think it was all that hard for them. Um, what they did to Duncan and Bear and the successive generations, I think in some ways was worse. There's, there, there's, there's no describing the hell that that is to start with, even back in 1953. But uh, I think in some ways where they learned from some of their mistakes, looking for that control, they ended up screwing up us people a lot more even than they did then. Though they were killing us then by the scores. And, and a lot of people were pulling out of that mentally stable in any way, shape, or form too. Uh, but like I say, this, the, 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 the centuries, the trauma, at triggering off those things, though, like I said, you know, like the smell of strawberries, just a little snatch of a tune, a smack in the head. <laughs> yeah. yeah, those bring back memories. Yeah, first person I think of is my mom. <laughs> yeah, in my case, I remember there's a lot of physical trauma, but there's a lot of exposure to 
their, their, their drug of choice for, for programming <coughs> was and probably still is LSD. And before the age of 12, to my best recollection, I most likely was doused at least 1,700 times that I know of. Oh my gosh. And that, that's without even giving a second thought and did dive into it too deeply. It may very well have been a hell of a lot more than that, but I, I, I really just don't know right now. It's, uh, you know, it's gut wrenching. It's gut wrenching to think about any of this as being, being a reality. Knowing that the stuff is still going on is what drives me to come forward now. Um, putting a stop to it, that's what's most important to me. Holding these idiots, for lack of a better way, and you may have to edit it, but these assholes need to be held accountable. And by God damn, with my last breath, as long as this meat suit is operating, they're on, you're on, you said the bitches are on notice. I'm coming. I'm coming for you. Count on it. I won't be alone. These, pro these programs are so pervasive and nobody has numbers on them. Um, if I just took the little universe that I live in, which is just this tiny little pocket on the internet somewhere, um, I'm aware of several hundred people that I've talked to, very few of who have done interviews, but I'm, I'm aware of people who have had or are having recalls, and, I, and I'm even talking younger people now, so I'm not convinced their programming's gotten better because in some ways it seems as though something else is breaking down now where they're never yeah, successful. Sure. It's not going to be contained. You know, as long as they hypnotize them, fill them full of freaking Cheetos and whatever will pacify them, you got about half of the American population. Exactly, exactly. You know, That's what I've like said for years. But the human yeah. spirit is not going to stay contained. The more they put on me, the more, let's say I started off vindictive, you know? It was like, okay, I get whipped when I'm good. I get whipped when I'm bad. I might as well be bad to earn that. You know, after a while, I start finding ways of kicking back. My handlers are studying me. I'm studying them. Mm -hmm. I'm learning the things where if I start doing this or that or my, my mission went this way or that way and, and I handled it a certain way, they start handling me like I might be a poisonous viper. Now I know I've got elbow room. This, this was my purchasing power for my own freedom and my own state of mind growing up a, a, as a young man and then when I ultimately left uh, uh, MKUltra in 78 uh, or, or did my damnedest. I mean, it's not like they ever left me. Uh, you know, a, a, at least every couple of years, sometimes even more so, they get active. Last year or so, they've been extremely active and you know, uh, targeting us and persecuting us and just making life it's as next to impossible as they can to, to, to live. Uh, in fact, that's one of the reasons why I'm out here with Bear. At uh, uh, January, I got put out of my own house in New England and, and uh, 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 put out into a blizzard, in a you know, New Hampshire blizzard with no resources and not even a phone number to call two cities away from where I live, but I couldn't talk to them either. At uh, uh, and uh, then some friends, Facebook friends, got together and helped rescue me, pulled me down to Boca Raton. Right. Stayed down there for, with Devin Mitch for about 10 months. We applied for, uh, uh, I need assisted living. I need to be reminded when to take my, my pills or my, my meds. It's not like I'm totally far gone off stupid. It's just that my registering of the passing time isn't so great and a lot of times some days i'll sleep 12 to 16 hours a day mm -hmm. narcolepsy just can't be avoided and and i may miss taking shots so somebody's got to remind me because if i'm not taking them I'm, I'm dying slowly right, right? right. And that's, that's kind of the state of that uh so deb and mitch were helping me uh, uh down there in boca uh they're like my heroes uh a uh, couple little people like five foot something uh 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 but hearts like this big yeah and, uh, yes. you know great people took me into yeah. their home shout out me, you guys if you're seeing this yep. yeah they might be watching it yeah they they, they they keep track of all of us 
uh, but um, we were trying to trying to get into something where I could get into some kind of extended living, but more and more doors were being shut. My medical files were being hacked at the do various doctor's office I was. The pharmacy got hacked five times for, for my meds and everything, and it's just it was just getting ridiculous. And I got hit by an SUV out, you know, just crossing a road from the pharmacy after I got one of those little rat nests you know, unsnarled there. Uh, there was no no rest. I mean, Deb and Mitch were fine. They're great, but they're also not used to this stuff. It's, right, right. That's her off in a big way. And I mean, I can't blame her. But here with Bear and and, and and them, we know this stuff. This is this has been life from the get go. That it, it really when it's different is when you make remarks. All right, but we're in a position now where we can kind of we're here and we can be glancing over each other's shoulders. We know what to watch for. We also know what to expect out of each other's personalities. There's certain things that kind of got induced with a great many of us in, in Ultra and the other programs. And it's like only somebody who's been in the program that is having a hard time trying to resist those impulses would possibly know what you were talking about or going through. Right. And uh, let's, let's see, I've been here about a month and a half now. Um, and it's been good. It's been it's been good. It's been a bomb on uh, all of us, which I think is a good indication that it's basically how it should be. Um, but it's for our, each of our personal protection, each of us in however way we can. I'm still not totally thrown away and disabled yet, uh, but like I can help Melissa. Melissa helps me. Bear, you know, we, we we're all useful to each other. Uh, you, you know, you're not just kind of being a burden on each other. Uh, so like I said, it's been a very therapeutic and a, and, and a good time here. Um, safety, well, safety is the best we can make it. Um, in our condition, in our situation, you never can tell exactly what they're going to start beaming at you next or hitting us with. Uh, I mean, even if you don't do anything, you know, don't commit a crime, they'll make one up if they want you bad enough. Right. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah, I've seen it. You know, the people with the, the military records, well, I, I, I was in the military, I had a record, uh, but Richard Helms destroyed it, but I can still tell you, I went in, uh, I, I, I joined just after my 17th birthday in 1970 uh, to the United States Navy. I thought I was getting away from MK Ultra. They didn't have internet, who would know, or freedom of information, <laughs> it was worse. I went into, uh, Great Lakes Naval Base in, in Michigan, a, 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 or Illinois, Michigan area there. Uh, um, uh, my captain was Captain F.M. Simons, was the captain of the base there, who was in the 11th Battalion, Company 305. My serial number back then, they weren't using Social Security, was Delta 110364. And my company commander was named David Croft. At uh, Company 305, I can tell you the name of the guy who had the first bunk in our barracks. You know, his name was Peter Parker. There was a couple people named after comic books in this. Place. Oh wow, Peter Parker, Spider-Man, yeah. yeah, yeah, Johnny Storm just down about several bunks away in the top bunk. Yeah, uh, you know, it looked like a fucking Marvel convention there. <laughs> uh, uh, and then they switched me off to UDT six, and then shortly after that, they were trying to press me into some other stuff. Um, ended up in Cambodia, which of course we're not, you know, Nixon said we weren't there, so if I can't say we're there, I could go to jail. Uh, so usually people ask me, well, where did you serve when you were in the service? I'd say, I wasn't in Cambodia. Well, where were you? Well, when the president said I wasn't in Cambodia, that's exactly where I wasn't in 1970. What were you doing? I wasn't killing Viet Cong, sneaking down through Laos and <laughs> in the south. <laughs> Duncan and uh, Duncan O'Finian and David Corso were also not in Cambodia. That's around exactly that right. Time, and they can verify that. Yeah, just, along with eleven other small children who got off of a helicopter and stood in the yeah. field and yeah. uh, proceeded so, to take out um, red Chinese assets. Yeah. Nope, none of that ever happened because all of it gets shredded at the end of the week. Just another day at the office for the spooks. Yeah, yeah I, I, I noticed it a lot. At least. The limited exposure of the, I'm going to try and be diplomatic with what I say. 
are on the coattails of people like Kerry Cassidy, I have no use for. Um, it's a dog and pony show that I disagree with, which is one of the reasons why I adamantly refuse. I did get called in to uh, be a part of last year. I said, no, I'm not going to do it. I refuse. Uh, the only people I'm going to deal with at this point are Duncan, John Storm, and you. And, uh, you know, many people, your listeners and watchers at the moment probably don't realize this is the very first time I am coming out. This is, uh, you know, a little bit of my story was mentioned with a couple of interviews back with, with Duncan, and he had my full permission with that, no problem. Uh, this is me. This is who I am. This is what I've been through. This is my reality. Welcome to a cupcakes and, uh, it's not fun. It's not pleasant. There's no Hollywood makeup here. Uh, the, the beat bullshit you see on that movie, American Ultra, is what it is. It's bullshit. It's make-believe. Uh, and it's not fun in games. It's, it's not a joyful time. It's a horrendous experience to have to be exposed to. Um, and I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. And that's saying a lot. <laughs> my enemies I don't think too highly of, but I wouldn't wish this on them. Uh, I kind of lost my train of thought there for a second, but um, that's okay. It was all connected. Cool, the teenagers find it cool that uh, this guy, you know, just works in a video store, and all of a sudden he's got freaking skill sets and and, and powers he never knew he had. And it's kind of like, oh, that's cool. I can do that. And it's kind of one. What kind of damage did you do when that happened? You found out. Number two. I remember all the horrors and all the faces of the people whose lights went out when I did that to them. Um, and, you know, and it's kind of, it's not necessarily comfortable, kind of, you know, there's a little something in you kind of, even like a snake in your gut, you know, when, when you see something like that, it just, it, if it doesn't trouble you, well, I guess in our case, there is plenty wrong with us to, you know, the, brightest psychological and neurological minds of the 20th and the 21st centuries have teamed together to completely screw with our heads in this country and they got damn good at it. Now, and I don't have, like I said, it's going to be a little bit discombobulated so I'll have to go back this, over this in interviews that come up later which I fully expect is going to happen. Because I, like I told you when I decided to come forward with this this is the beginning and uh, taking the gloves off and we're, I'll dive into whatever I need to dive into for those who it might help, especially those that maybe are going through it and there is light at the end of the tunnel kind of thing. Uh, if I can be a David Corsos for somebody down the road, that's, I hope to be able to do that because thank God there was somebody like that there when I needed it. Because at the time, I think I probably would have committed suicide. I know mean, I was on the verge of it. I was losing it. Um, and some of you know, going back over it, you know, the, the skill sets, you know, one of, one of the strongest skill sets I have, I wouldn't classify it as necessarily psychic abilities or, or anything of that nature, but re remote viewing, something I'm very good at, um, something I was utilized for. Uh, memory of the flashcard deal sitting at the cubicles, the little, the little school desk things that flip open at the top, having, having the puzzles put on, on top of the desk, put the puzzle together kind of thing, and uh, going through that process. And it, mm -hmm. it happened for me the same way it happened for Duncan. It wasn't a, none of it was pleasant. It was you're dropped off, you're in a room with a bunch of other kids, you sit at the desk, you shut your mouth, you put, give them the puzzle, you put the puzzle together, do it in a timely fashion, you get hit in the roar, you get hit, hit across the face, you get hit in the back of the head. Um, at one point, having, having the headgear on, and, and uh, as you're doing it, you're not doing it fast enough, so they're giving you an electric shock. And th those are memories I have. Uh, and again, for me, it, it's not pleasant. It, this, is, this is not an easy thing to sit here and talk about. This is gut-wrenching for me. Um, I'm not comfortable. I know you're not. It, it's, it's something that needs to be done. It's something that needs to be addressed. We need 
put a stop to this bullshit, and we need to do it now. These children deserve a chance at living, and they're not getting it. They're being stripped of their humanity, they're being turned into machines at this point. I, I, I don't know what to make of that other than it needs to be stopped. Uh, Maybe for what it's what it's worth, and you know, um, it's all fine and great if you're in, if you're into watching something like this because you're into the horror story for it. I feel sorry for you. I just feel sorry for you. It's because that's such a small aspect of it. The fact of the matter is, is this crap has gone on, is going on, and it needs to be stopped. And the people that are responsible need to be held accountable. It's demonic, satanic. Luciferian Illuminati garbage. Uh, somebody wants to argue whether or not the Jewish Holocaust ever happened in World War II. Well, I mean, me, I'm still incensed. I don't believe everybody's outraged enough to to uh, one outside. Don't you? And I don't believe everybody's out, outraged enough to to. It's kind of like, oh yeah, all right, they did that in Europe. I'm not going to be a Holocaust denier or anything like that. But they came here. This people, the supposedly righteous nation that helped defeat the Nazis, brought them here and says, do it to our children. No, oh, they, we, became, children. we became the Fourth Reich. They're American children, let's, uh, let's do to them what you did to the Jews. And nobody's going to say anything ever. In fact, when we talk about it now, somewhere out there, you know, there's going to be somebody smirking about this as if... Uh, you know, you know, our, our cheese is slid off our cracker somewhere. You know, uh, um, you know, and, you know, don't don't deny the Holocaust. It's kind of like what's worse than the Holocaust is bringing it here and turning it loose on American kids. I thought we were protecting our country from from these awful things, and it's kind of no. We became all of these awful things. Well, we imported it. We became that spade has to be called a freaking shovel before. Before my life is over. I, I, we became what we supposedly conquered, you know. But from the moment that they brought Sidney Gottlieb to the United States, from the minute that Ewan Cameron began his experiments, um, we actually established ourselves as the continuance of the Third Reich or the Fourth Reich, far more militaristic, operating in ways that the Nazis would have never in their wildest dreams have imagined. And doing even what the Nazis themselves did not do. They, they didn't use their own children this way, to my knowledge. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong on this, John, but we reached a level of sophistication that I can only attribute at this point to what Bear said earlier. This is satanic, it's Luciferian. It is, it is a spiritual war now, as much as it is a war of technology and intelligence assets. And you know, where I wanna go with this, and, and bear any time you wanna lace in anything you wanna say, I want you to be comfortable with it, but don't hold back either, and I know you won't. The spiritual side of this, this warfare, is the most significant thing that nobody's talking about. John talks about it a lot. You talk about it a lot, Bear. What has happened on the internet is it's become a comic book. Um, a lot of what takes place on alternative media websites now is a bunch of children playing games. Yeah. And whether they realize it or not, even if they're legitimate, They've been co-opted by people who are, and in fact, themselves handlers inside the media, using this as a means to dilute the real message. Because people get caught that. up in all the woo-woo. Yeah, I believe that. I, I was seeing that for a little while, and I was becoming very angry and very sensitive about it. Um, um, because I feel this deeply. I've been, you know, so, some people get up and say, oh, no, I, my life has been threatened. And it's kind of like, okay, yeah, that means today's Tuesday. Um, it has been like that. It has been like, I still got the scars down my legs from 
from, from hugging this SUV coming at me at high speed in Boca Raton. I still, when I when I try to collect, get my meds, and that, and I'm severe diabetic, so it's like when I need my meds, I need my meds. All right, I've already had two strokes. Um, uh, uh, but when I go to get them, I don't get them all, or I get something else. That the, 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 the records get tampered with. The only record that doesn't get tampered with, medical file, well, I don't have it on now, but I, I, I have a set of dog tags. Med alerts, yeah. USB, little, you know, medical alert, USB. Yep. In my file, my picture, and all the information anybody needs to save my life, but I don't believe they will. Um, <laughs> when, it, when it comes, it's going to come. But, you know, like any good soldier, you know, we know we ain't living forever, not like this. And personally, I'm kind of appreciative of that. <laughs> this hurts. Yeah. Uh, it's taken a lot of years. Uh, I mean, the, you're absolutely right, Randy, as far as the spiritual warfare. It's more of a spiritual war now than it's ever been. Um, and the, the sad truth and reality of it is, is that, at least in my particular case, it started out from the very the darkest of the dark side of the spiritual realm that you can you could start at with the black black Bible and all the satanic rituals that you can have at your disposal. Being trained at, at an early age from the Wiccan perspective, the pagan perspective, but the dark aspect of it, the negative aspect of it, giving those giving those tools to engage in spiritual warfare to do harm. To another human being, um, and I've since gone the other route, seeking it out on my own, getting the training, having several teachers and shamans at my disposal that have been teachers of mine over the years that have given me the so-called light side of it. And what I've been able to do with that is balance, find a balance between the two, you know, because I'm not all dark and I'm not all light. I'm it's what Duncan people. calls the gray walkers. Basically, you're walking in that 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 threshold between the dark and the light, which is actually that, that's always yeah. That's always been that, that, that even goes back with the Celts and the Druids. Yes, and the, the, the high holy times and observations occur at twilight, either either at uh, mm -hmm. dawn in the morning or at dusk, at between time. Uh, they're the ones that will also meet on crossroads between two places. Uh, months and dates and, and that, that are between kind of times. Uh, they may eat mushrooms because, you know, when you say animal, vegetable, mineral, and so on, it's not quite, it's one of those kind of between kind yeah, of items. Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah, so they're always big on choosing the power of that transitional period. You know, when it's not night and it's not exactly day, but it's something... Yeah, that's when things are malleable. That's when magic can easier take Exactly. Form. Yep. Yeah. Twilight and dawn. Um, they're different. They're different. And yet they're both to me windows. I mean, I, 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 when I get to experience a dawn under certain light conditions, it's like very magical. And twilight, oh, yeah. twilight's the same thing. Twilight to me feels like I'm walking into a portal. Yeah. Yeah. Where the world's going to be completely different. You're going from night to realms of day, or vice versa. At uh, 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 those, are, those are good. Those are always great times for for doing magic. Um, you both come from. I'll say that what you present is spiritual backgrounds. Barry, you kind of represent more of a Native American type um, with the pipe ceremonies. John, you you kind of tend more towards the the, the Celtic, um, yeah, Danaean. Yeah, and in all of this, there's a lot of commonality. The expressions oh, right. of the spirituality. In fact, it's the merchants. I remember when Duncan told me that one of the parts of his profile for MK Ultra had to do with the fact that he was both Native American and Celt as well. So these are apparently backgrounds that they 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 value because they understand the connectedness of the ancient powers 
There, there is. It's, it's interesting, like, uh, well, one of my other degrees is cultural anthropology, and I've been studying some of this, but, but it's an interesting about the ancient Celts. They, well, we, had, we lived in clan communities, longhouses, chieftains. We had shamans. The, the druids and the witches were actually two horns of the same bull as far as our infrastructure. It wasn't just a religion. It was basically our infrastructure. All right, uh, they were matriarchal societies, which mean, meant that a woman could become the clan chieftain too, or she could serve in some position of authority as much as any man. Mm -hmm. uh, among the Native Americans, actually just about every aboriginal society is somewhat matriarchal. They believe basically if we're gonna survive and thrive as a clan and a community, we need to be walking in a nice even step, not with a decided limp treating the woman as a second class, you know, the left leg is not as good as the right leg, so we don't right. step on that one very often, yeah, you know? yeah. uh, uh, any of that kind of crap, so that, that, that kind of falls through there. So the societies are very much the same. On, on a related note, recently I've been, re I, I've been reading some of the reports of, you know, those DNA testing things, the genetic testing things they, they've been doing all over the world. Uh, some of the more recent archaeological finds here in America is that they're finding that haplo group B, which is around from around Central Europe, is in the DNA of people, you know, skeletons found here over 10,000 years ago. Hmm. Uh, the Native American, yeah. so some of that haplo group were actually probably somewhere back much further ancient. We are related, <laughs> you know. As they said, Metakliye or Yasin, you know, we are related. <laughs> so, Bear, talk a little bit about your, your traditions, um, the pipe ceremony, what you're involved with, um, and how that impacts your own spiritual healing. It was like uh, 15, 20 years ago, going back now, Jesus, it's been that long. That the torch was passed to me by one of my later teachers, Dancing Cloud, and her mentor, Philip Moondancer, who were passed the torch for the lodge, which at the time was called Heart Medicine Lodge, which originated with Red Eagle and Badger Woman. And uh, I was one of the ver one of the first students that was willing to. Put everything I had to into it, and I was there for whenever dancing cloud called upon me. I was I was there. Whenever she did ceremony of any kind, I was there. I was on her coattails for everything. And, and you know, a lot of the the native teachers, you've you've got to be on them. And it was uh, lots of gifts of tobacco pouches. I'll put it that way to get to get the teachings because there's always something given for what you're getting and receiving. And as a result of being willing to be Johnny on the spot with that, I was able to be selected because that's what it is. I, uh, I was selected. I, I did. I did not choose a medicine path per se. Mm -hmm. My own volition. It was something I was born into. It's also part of my bloodline and who who I am. Um, my biological family. The it goes back seven generations of medicine people that um, not all of them picked up the torch and carried it. I happen to be one out of out of seven generations since the beginning that was willing to do that. And it just naturally came to me, working with crystals, working with the pipe, working with the medicine wheel. These are all things that I just intuitively already knew. Just now, how were you able to, how were you able to recover your own heritage um given that you were adopted and given that uh, obviously you went into these programs where they kind of let's just say massage your personalities were you were aware of your own heritage your own background your own blood yeah, from your early age okay for, for whatever reason the, the adopted family that I, that I was put into Exposed me to the to the native my native heritage early on. Of course, first and foremost, what they exposed me to was the satanic church and the ritual and the abuse to break me down. The other side of it was, I guess, to kind of 
soften a blow and to reinforce. So for me, it was kind of getting beat with the whip and then here's the ice cream afterwards kind of thing. Uh, and it was something that I was able to hold on to. And it didn't stick with me because at, when I was growing up, being Native American was definitely not something that you wanted to associate. Right, with. right, yeah. Because uh, I still remember as, from an early, I still grew up in the time period where being Native American, you were looking to getting beaten up, uh, mugged, whatever, whatever the case may be on the street, just not something that you wanted to associate with. Being called half-breed most of my life, you know, being half Celt and half Native American. It's just one of those things. But later on, uh, it was probably my mid-30s when I started really picking back into my, my heritage and really diving into that and really sinking my te teeth into it. I mean, I've been dabbling in my mid-20s through all the MK Ultra stuff and what I was going through. It was an anchor for me, you know. This is this is what's real. This is what's solid for me. And uh, after my accident in 2003, when I came home, is when I really, really dove into it. It was 96, 97 when I did my initial vision quest, and that's when the gifts really came. When I got a chance to really apply that was after 2003 when I came home. Uh, after the recovery period and getting out of the hospital, getting out of the wheelchair. Also, I, I attribute that majority of that to the MK Ultra conditioning. It, it was, you don't just bounce back from being blown up unless something else has been put in place there. Uh, uh, unlike some of these jokers that are out there, I, for, I forgot what his name is. He's associated with the, the late Max Spears and he's currently in prison. I forgot his name, excuse me, but um, you know, Casball, you know, he's talk, he talks oh, about yeah. that mesh intertwined thing in his skeletal system. Why? Well, personally, I find that to be a bunch of bullshit. You know, um, but there is conditioning, it hardens the bones, hardens the muscle tissues, and it enables the body to bounce back from whatever it's been put through. Um, John Storm is living proof of that. You know, um, wasn't too, too long ago where there's pictures of him where he, as he puts it, it looks like Smeagol. And now you look at it completely different. Um, and that's all part of the conditioning program that comes back. I attribute my own healing to that as well. The spiritual aspect of it where I've been able to get to where I'm at today, I attribute that 100% to the traditions and the teachings of the medicine wheel, the seven sacred ceremonies, the Tanupa, which is the sacred pipe, and applying those principles of those teachings to my life and using them on a regular basis. It's not something I don't live. I don't, it's not a whim. I, I, I mean, I don't wear a headdress. I don't walk around in, in leathers. And when I do put on ceremonial garb, it's not, it's not for show and tell. It's not for Halloween. This is something that's a part of a ceremony. It, it, something that I earned. I mean, the tattoo I have here on my upper arm, this is part of a medicine society. This is a spiritual tattoo that was gifted to me. And I earned the right to carry this, this mark. Mm -hmm. uh, it's part of the, it represents the teachings that have been passed down to me. And it, wherever I go, um, all I have to do is show this tattoo. And if I'm around other native people that have also been through these, these teachings, they recognize it right away. And there's a, a, a mutual respect and, and love given. given. Um, the teachings themselves, as far as it, it's counteracted the negative stuff, the satanic stuff that I've been exposed to. It's more well-rounded. And I have since been able to learn, you know, now I've got my disposal teachers that are, are well-versed in, in the Wiccan pagan side, the Celtic side, so I can reincorporate those teachings but from a positive perspective rather than negative perspective that I was exposed to as a child. And uh, combine those things together, that's how I get through my day. That's how I, that's how I survive. That's how I live. Uh, it's something I live and breathe every single day. I, uh, you know, build, building a medicine wheel is something I do. It's a, it's a tool I use for my healing. I step into that circle. I give everything I am to that circle and to that energy 
and utilize that energy and what Mother Earth gives back to me to empty out what I what I carry and take into me what I need to carry so I can move forward. You know, the, the sweat lodge for me is all about death and rebirth. That's the whole process. You're going in there to shed all that negative stuff and you come out reborn. And what you come out with is what you carry forward. And you could drop the negative at any time. And it's, a, it's a process. It's a daily process. And then some days are better than others. Um, not all my days go according to plan. They're not all good. Um, yeah. Some are downright good at wrenching, especially especially as of late with a lot of the stuff that's come out and, and coming forward, especially after Max Spears passed away, which uh, let's all be frank and be honest and call it spade a spade. The man was murdered. Um, they watched it happen. You know, it, if you watch the last, the very last video, you can watch watch it take place right before your very eyes, and it's it's gut wrenching to watch. Yeah. You know. That could have been me. That could have been John Storm. That could be Duncan. That could be any one of us be put in that situation. And when you realize that, I mean, Jesus, you know, the the, the unthinkable for for these group of idiots that put us through these programs. Their worst nightmare is sitting here in this room. You know, the last thing that they ever wanted was John Storm, Medicine Bear White Bull, Duncan O'Finian to communicate together, let alone be in the same room, let alone live together, let alone work together and take our combined horrors and take our combined good teachings and combine those things together, heal ourselves, heal each other, and heal our families, and then take that information out there into the general world and present it to them in a way that here, you can use these tools to heal as well. You two can await shed the veil of this bullshit and let's get down to the meat and potatoes of what's real. Let's tear apart and look at look at what's really going on within the whole transhumanism movement, which is a whole other show in and of itself, which is to me very interesting but also very frightening. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I agree with you there. And there it, it all rotates into one subject matter at some point. What we usually do on this show is after about an hour, we take maybe a five or six minute break, give everybody a chance to, I don't know, my bladder is not getting better as years go on and uh, we're filtering coffee right now. So let's do this. Let's take about a six or seven minute break, guys. Uh, the listeners will get a video and uh, we'll be back with uh, section two of this interview with uh, Medicine Bear and John Storm on Off Planet TV. We'll be right back.
Welcome back to the second half of Our Planet TV. My guests, John Storm and Medicine Bear, Medicine Bear White Bow. And um, this is kind of a round table for us three tonight to sit down and go through some disclosure that um, you've probably not heard before, especially from Bear, who really this is the first time out for him. And you have to bear in mind that um, we're not actors here. We're not professionals, and this is not about drama, theater, and entertainment. This stuff's real. You know, uh, to, to use the old phrase, man, shit just got real. Well, when people bare their soul and tell you something about their life that goes to the depth and the core of the evil that exists in our culture, um, I don't want to put the dressing on this. I want it to be real. I want it to be bare bones. And I want the listeners out there to understand that the reason for doing this is to inform people, to get them to understand what has been going on with these programs, not just in the United States, but globally. And so guys, welcome back. Thank you. And um, we're going to kind of tilt it a little bit. John's written about this a lot. I don't know where you are in the continuum on this, but from my experiences, as a kid and the experiences of a lot of people I've talked to, um, the UFO ET thing sits out there on kind of an intersection to mind control programs. I don't know where this all shakes out. Um, I suspect it's worse than I think it is, but um, it seems like something happened and it happened right after World War II. You know, I, I've always drawn the line only because it's convenient, not because it's legitimate at Roswell, only because that's the most notable event. But obviously, we had Maury Island. We had any number of other events that were going on in that particular era that lead us to believe that after World War II, the veil started to thin very fast and something was appearing out of the cracks that we had broken open as a result of unleashing the atomic bomb and global warfare. John, maybe you can pick up the narrative and kind of kind of pull some of these threads together. Um, well, you're right about that. Well, they've been, there's, the, the, the evidence suggests they've been visiting us forever. Absolutely, but, yeah, I agree. Right, there was a change. Right, uh, precisely about the time we're talking about the atomic age. Um, now, when you're going to open up a, 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 a gateway or a portal into the continuum or, or into what they call hyperspace or a wormhole, um, I got a story that I did, and it's, it's really not fiction. It's called Party with the Yellow Portals. And it's about an experiment opening a rift into another plane of existence called Quinid. And in it, I used energy to open, to make, to kind of open the, the time-space continuum. It's kind of like fabric, mm -hmm. right? In, a, in an unstable spot, an already unstable spot. And the times that you're talking about, well, consider, you know, the Trinity blast. They were blasting. It wasn't just what happened in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. They were blasting them darn things. I mean, from the, from the 50s and 60s, you could watch an atomic blast from here. Um, you know, so all that energy, you know, like the energy of a small sun being unleashed on the surface of the earth, okay, it's opening stuff. And about that time, we're getting all this attention. Now, we know from some of the old stuff, flying saucers, you know, you can even see them in medieval paintings and coins. And, and, and we know that they've always existed, but the things that's been going on, um, you're not finding a bunch of tombs full of mummies with freaking heads full of hardware like I've got. All right, since the early 50s, I wouldn't have believed it either. I was told all this stuff was, you know, if the kids got a vivid imagination. I didn't know until I got the MRIs a couple years ago that I just, I'm so loaded, it ought to say, I ought to have a tattoo right here that says Uh um, um There's just so much hardware there. I mean, very visible, very seen. And there's no human way possible to get that in without killing me, especially the, that one teardrop shaped thing right in the center of my the, the third eye, yeah. that little gland there in the middle. And, uh, it's kind of like, you can't do that without killing somebody. So it has to be something extra dimensional. 
And I do remember the grades when I was little uh, and told it was my imagination. So now what do I think? Well, I saw some other things, but as far as I know, hey, I thought these guys were imaginary for the longest time uh, uh, until you see the evidence for yourself. Um, there, something did happen after that. The government doesn't want to admit something. Even the last time they let out any of the Roswell stuff, the pages were almost black. But, you know, when two presidents asked for yeah. that, yeah, and it's not even fire. worth. Yeah, it's not even fire. worth filing a FOIA for because all you get back is is this this these black lines all over a document. Yeah, yeah, uh, and I remember the MK Ultra documents too, and what ones that I could glean. I'm looking for information like like the rest of us have been, uh, but it, it was that way. It, it was that way with the UFO thing, and it does play into it. I mean, the technology is there. What's it doing? Where? What, where did it come from? What, how much of it is still working? How much of it is faulty and causing some of the problems that I've been enduring? Um, why they let them do this to us? Why, you know, what's what's going on? There's something, it's whatever it is, they won't admit it. They won't even admit, you know, when you get a mile wide UFO flying over Phoenix and several other, you know, tens of thousands of people see it and the government still, not a word, not a, not a word. We ain't admit nothing. That was probably flares. Uh, you know, so lame. It yeah, it's a hell of a flare, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> yeah, so lame. It's just absolutely unbelievable they gave that as an excuse uh, or a debunking, you know. Uh, um, but they're obviously desperately trying not to speak about their part in whatever's going on with these fellas. The, you know, the grays, like I said, I know about. I can't deny that. Uh, the tall whites, maybe. Um, some of the others, I, I can't say I don't have personal experience or at least nothing that I can call concrete enough to, to uh, call out on, but I can say for sure that they got them, they're doing something. Uh, I believe a lot of this technology we're seeing today, the jumps that I see, and I got my first IBM PC in 1985. It had 256K of memory, mm -hmm. uh, two 360K disk drives online. You got the big one. Wow. Monitor. This thing costed five grand. People yeah. say you rich or what? Uh, um, uh, uh, and they couldn't get the RAM memory up over a megabyte. In fact, they couldn't quite touch a megabyte. You know, Tandy was selling these PC clones that came up to 0. 0.9 megabytes. Yeah, the trash eighty. Yeah, the trash eighty. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, 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 uh. And then in a few years, it's like, man, I got, I got like 250 some odd gigabytes of RAM on this little laptop we're talking on. Yeah. It's like, this is bigger, this is bigger and far more powerful than the mini computers I used to work on when I went to college. Right. You know, uh, uh, it, it's incredible, but that's this technology taking this term, these cell phones, gee, they look like Captain Kirk now. Uh, and that's not by accident either, is it? No, it's uh, not. You know, uh, um, well, still, I, I still imagine you get Scotty to beam me the hell up. <laughs> yeah, where's that part of the technology at, really? But actually, it does exist. And, you know, that's, that's where this all gets really off the rails, is when you begin to deal with the people that have had abduction experiences or what is loosely called contact experiences, there's, there's a familiar overlap. I mean, you've got people who have stepped into a field, they have sleep paralysis, they have missing time, there's a sense of moving into another direction, and then all of a sudden you're pulled out, sometimes physically, sometimes astrally. Yeah. You're in some place else, and for what purpose? And it looked to me as I've gone through this over the years, that enough people have said, you know, I remember being in underground bunkers. I remember white coats. I remember military people. I saw, let's just say, strange experiments that were going on. That it looks to me like collaboration between much well, like... I can't think of anything else but that. You know, when, you, when, when, when I went in in my day, you know, they, they were like dislocating my ankle. Some of the experiments and the things that they were doing, some of it was, I believe, was gene therapy, um, uh, especially because some of the things that go on, the way I heal, what, 
some of this stuff is just so strange. Uh, but I mean, they were doing it in a lot earlier than I thought they would. But the inhumanity of it, like we were speaking earlier about the you know, Jewish Holocaust, and it's like, and nobody ever thinks that they did this on purpose, bringing these guys here to do this to us. Right. They did horrible things to us. Some of us, they sodomized just in front of others just to keep this person a fracture. This person is getting wasted, and you're going to see this little kid tossed away dead and lifeless right in front of you, you know, just completely desecrated as a human soul. And, you know, the inhumanity of it. And then you switch from these doctors doing these things, poking you with needles, uh, 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 microfracturing your bones, electroshocking you. Now you've got these very, very unhuman things also doing all kinds of fantastic stuff to you that you have no idea and no say-so and no control over whatsoever. And, uh, that's, it's, it's, it, it was frightening from the beginning. It, I, it was more than a little disturbing when I, when, I, when I learned for myself from my MRIs that, damn, I was loaded up. Um, uh, that was not my imagination, you know. First, it's just your curiosity. That's kind of a cute thing for a little boy to imagine, you know. Uh, uh, but I, I, MK Ultra memories are much worse than what I remember of the Braves, but still. You know, there, that, that inhuman thing, that inhuman connection, that the fact that this inhuman thing happened in World War II in Central Europe uh, 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 to all these people being experimented on as if they didn't matter, didn't count, didn't count for anything in, in, you know, in the grand scheme of the universe. And then they bring it over here and do it to us and change us and they mess with our society and all this with the mind control, very inhuman, just to profit from everybody else's misery. You know, the medical program is a success here. Almost everybody is sick and being treated for something. That's exactly right, yeah. yeah good right. customers. Uh, You're good customers out there. You're consuming. Big Pharma likes you. Right. Oh, definitely. Yeah, now we're not useless eaters and, you know, as long as we're sucking yeah, down. You've got to be a consumer, man. Yeah. But that's yeah, – and then, and then yeah. your war oh, mentality. It's really scary. This, this, this endless war, and, the, and this is the, the part that – really tells you that things are off off the rails we yeah. haven't been at peace in this country almost ever specifically here in america but even around the planet we've been in a perpetual state of war there's something in us that i don't think is natural but that is kind of imbued into us to want to kill it doesn't seem it doesn't seem natural or normal to me to want to kill under no. any circumstance. And yet we deal with war like it's some normal part of the landscape of our reality. When in fact, as you both know, because of having gone through the programs, this is a ritual. Yeah. This is yeah, something that's ritualistically being done to split the collective consciousness of humanity the same way that Ultra was splitting the consciousness of individual people. Yeah. Well, people that, that want freedom also don't understand what they want is responsibility. And the people that don't want the freedom don't want the responsibility. They, they are like the, uh, I remember when I was a boy, you know, jailbirds were described to me as men who got so used to living in a regulated prison system that they really couldn't live and couldn't bear living outside of the prison right. system. Yeah. All right. You show me an institution designed to bring up children, public schools, first two words that should come to mind, uh, uh, and I'll show you, I'll show you a system that that prepares students or human beings to be institutionalized. Okay, they yeah. cannot exist outside of the institution. So the people think you vote for this guy, he makes up all the rules. He you know, he's not a king, he's not just, that's what they teach us in school. But when you get up there and you see this statue of Abraham Lincoln, the size of freaking Zeus in, in, in a palace, well, of course they're gods and they're gonna do everything for us. So that's not our responsibility. If they wanna go make wars with those guys, 
Well, those are probably bad guys anyway. The government wouldn't do anything to hurt us or to mislead us in any way. Well, for guys like us, that that argument just it has never That's a floated. Point. It's like, when will you wake up? People are still upset that Hillary didn't get elected. It's kind of like, yeah, he's never <laughs> <laughs> Snowflake <laughs> alert. <laughs> yeah, they ain't getting it yet. Yeah, but... But like I say, for us, it's kind of like you can't fool us that the government's going to take care of us and do this for us. And Because I never saw mercy. I never saw rescue. You know, no child left behind. I've never seen any of these things that they promised. Never. Not once in my life did I get a bit. I didn't have to fight for it or make somebody back off just to long enough to leave me alone to have a meal in peace. You know, uh, uh, but that's what they become, and that's what everybody's become. They lack this responsibility. Well, who's going to fix the roads if we don't have a government? The guys that you've been paying as government can go fix the roads. Look, a quarter of a million dollars a year, you can throw a few shovels full of asphalt in the pothole. Right. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Completely desensitized society is what we're, we're now watching unfold before our very eyes. It's, it's just... It's sad and it's gut wrenching. It's disgusting. I mean, especially in light of the the, the latest debacle, you know, because I, I won't refer to it as an election. It's a it's a debacle. It's it's yeah. a circus act, and you know, all the, the world's a stage, and we're the ones that are you know being played here. Yeah. It's just a sick joke. One of the things that made sense to me, and. I started researching this stuff back in the late 70s. I read um, Motor Bullets, Operation Mind Control. Uh, concurrently with that, I also found the book The Serious Mysteries by Robert Temple. These two books entered my life seemingly by happenstance, and I started to read them almost in around the same time, which began to unpack a lot of different things. Um, a few few years later, I discovered the work of Bob Monroe, who started the Monroe Institute. Oh, okay. I know what you're talking about, yeah. Which was, you know, probably, Monroe probably began to formalize the procedures for remote viewing mm -hmm. in parallel with what was going on at, at, at Stanford Research Institute. So, yeah. you know, he was sort of mirroring what Ingo Swan and... Um, the guys out in SRI were doing. But yeah. in, in reading Monroe's work, one like of the things... I like his better than Swan's, in fact. <laughs> yeah, I, and, and you know, that, that, that modality that he developed, to me, is a more natural approach than... Yeah, I like um, his heavy sink approach, because, see, in our family, we were using principles that would accomplish about the same thing, different things, yeah. but using audio and a number of other things. Uh, I remember because in the early years I tested some of that too, and uh, I found it very easy to get into. The stuff that they went from Ingo Swan on after that, to my mind, got so compartmentalized that in my mind I wasn't seeing what I was normally seeing as well as I was seeing it. I was giving information. The military know, grade, which was back. SRI, which was how Pudoff and that team out there. Yeah, they were they were very much under the direction of the army at that point to come up with a standardized standardized procedure. Um, I think what Monroe was doing and what even what Western European remote viewers were using as well was a little too exotic for them. They wanted something that was a very disciplined, structured, almost mm -hmm. militarist military type protocol to do this. But when I was reading Mon Monroe's materials and probably his later books where he was going out of body, where he was just, he was mm -hmm. completely astral. He, yeah. had, he was going out beyond the zone of the physical and interacting with entities. Mm -hmm. The whole concept of loose harvesting, which is, you know, he coined the term or he brought the term back. This concept that there are entities that are harvesting us astrally and energetically, both yeah. collectively and as individuals, based on fear triggers. Now we can bring this thing forward into what I see as being large-scale MK Ultra because of the fear levels that they elevate constantly. I mean, yeah. this, 
this last election, if there's one thing we saw in this, and I don't want to dwell on it, but it's a recent yeah. example, so we'll grab it and we'll use it, was based completely on two horrible choices and a lot of fear and a lot of paranoia. Oh my God, if Trump gets in, we'll have a racist, he's yeah. a hater. Um, the other side of this was, and it's all legitimate, yeah. you have Hillary Clinton finally exposed as a satanic pedophile along with all these other people. Yeah. And the fear level was one of people being crammed into a very narrow chute to make a horrible choice quickly because <clears throat> they were quite concerned about what was gonna to happen to the country. Like, you know, like any of this has anything at all to do with what's really going on in the background. Right. So we have the elevated fear levels, the paranoia, the electronic mind control that's going on in the background. And I mean, I don't know. I will say that leading up to the election for about two to three weeks, except for the time that I spent in the mountains the week before the election, I felt there was a very elevated psychotronic level of activity going on all around. Um, EMF, so. ELF waves, all kinds of... Um, triggering actions inside of electronics. Um, the digital media became insane. The right. well, I was trying media. to guess too. I, I, I still have a couple pieces of my paranormal equipment, but it also, it also tests well for those EMFs, you know, other yeah. fields. And that, you know, you're feeling something and it's like you can pick it up with the instrument while it's not in your head anymore. In fact, I just made a meme that I added to my Facebook page about... Uh, basically for targeted individuals. You know, a lot of people are kind of going through this loneliness. It's like the alienation yeah. and everything. And, you know, they think I'm crazy. And it's like, look, there's ways, if you want to get up and you really want to prove it, there's ways to prove it you're not, or maybe you are. Uh, uh, but that psychotronic stuff, I, uh, you know, uh, Solaris educated me a lot about some of it. I mean, I knew about some, and I was aware of some of the effects. But as to exactly what it was and what was causing it, I really didn't know. And then, of course, once she kind of start giving me the basis of some of the technology, it's like, oh, you could test for this. You know, it's like you don't just have to take it. Well, I'm being microwaved. I'm hearing voices in my head. Well, you're neurotic. You're this. You're that. And it's like, you know, what made you give that unqualified statement considering I said I hear voices in my head, so therefore I must be this. You know, there's patents out there for devices that do exactly that. Voice to, uh, uh, voice to skull technology, yeah. It, it's there, it, like I say, it's, it's measurable. And if it is, then it's not in your head. It's something physical on the outside affecting you. Um, you know, we always knew it because we kind of go through the extremes with this. And that was the whole thing behind the ultra part of the program was the extremes. You know, the 80 year old grandmother going out and finding her grandson hit by a car and lifting the car up off of him. And at that extreme, that extreme fear, that extreme yeah. adrenaline rush and everything that makes you go beyond what the human norm is. And that's what they kind of did with us. They tried to stick that to get us. You know, but we were useful to them in a certain way. But there's a lot of people they did that to amp up their adrenaline and everything else via, via drugs and that to see what they could do to make these super soldiers for themselves. And if they failed and if they gave them seizures and it, they just put them in a psych unit or in a shallow grave somewhere. You know, uh, and, and they've done this for years, for decades, and nobody's done anything about it. I mean. We've all gotten up and spoke about it. Duncan, probably foremost of anybody I know, um, you know, uh, um, but uh, you know, it, it's still there. Nobody came to rescue us, and to this day, nobody's coming to rescue me. They'll send you things about save the puppies and the homeless dogs that get euthanized from the ASPCA and all this stuff. And I'm talking about human beings. I'm talking about fellow Americans, uh, 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 not some overpaid Kenyan in a freaking Oval Office. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm talking about American children. You know, you want to talk about horrors of horrors and decent, and nobody cares. Nobody, that's somebody else's problem. And it's kind of like, look, if you can think like that, exactly what level of humanity are you? You know, you, you, you know are, are you a full glass? You know, is this the glass half empty or half full? 
Well, I'm kind of an optimistic realist. It's an election year. The, gar the, the glass is half full of shit. <laughs> you know, but I mean, is this what we become? Is this what we degraded into? It's, it's what they're trying, but that, that human spirit in some of us, people like me, like Duncan, like Bear, like, like a number of others that you've met, they did all this. They did it. They did everything they could chain and enslave and bind us in every which way, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, physically. Uh, but we still rise above it, break through it. Uh, um, uh, you know, it, it doesn't, it, it's not, they're not strong enough. They believe they are. They like to make you believe they are. That's part of the propaganda. But the truth, the truth right here that you see on this little radio show here is the fact is they aren't strong enough. They can be beaten. They can be even beaten back by one or two people. And if you got more of you to go together to watch each other's back and stand for each other, we can take our power back in this country. Uh, it's going to be hard work. I know a lot of lazy people ain't going to want to. They're going to want the government to continue taking care of them right until the FEMA cars pull up uh, to take you to camp. Uh, you know, but uh, uh, you know, it's going to be hard cleaning up the mess they leave us. The money ain't going to be worth nothing. And to me, I don't care what kind of debt they say it is. I don't owe money to a criminal because he said so. <laughs> you know, he made it. Yeah, deal with exactly. I don't. Yeah, I don't have a wedding contract with that agreement either. So I'm still looking for that. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of like you know, you know, you guys stole enough money from the world already. If you just stop right now and shut up and stay out of our lives, build your nice little walls a little higher so you can stay safer within them, the rest of the world will leave you alone if you leave us alone. Otherwise, to me, Bilderberg meeting list is a hit list. Amen. Yeah, you want to see a better world tomorrow? These guys got to leave it today. <laughs> yeah. One way, shape, or form. You know, I'm not advocating one thing or another, but I'm just saying basically where our problems come from. Look, you and I do not have any problem with Assad whatsoever. None. No. Nope. Nope. Not a, you can't even say maybe he dresses bad. I don't know. I don't care. But the fact is you and me and most of the American people, I'd say 99.99999% of them have no problem at all with Assad. We got no problem at all with Iraq. We got no problem at all with Pakistan. Uh, they never did anything to us. They say, yeah, they got a lot of refugees coming, but whose fault is that? Uh, exactly. Uh, yeah. We're yeah. buying yeah. these bombs, these missiles. We, we, we send a million dollar missile to take out some poor bastard in a $10 jet. And then uh, uh, the drone, <laughs> people are in fear for their lives every time they hear a sound in the sky. I, I imagine that makes them like the great American way all the more, all, all the better. It's it's insanity. But the people that industrial military complex, those are the people making the money from it. These are people that are getting richer and richer while we murder more and more of each other. And then they're even stealing the resources while there's all the conflict going around. You know, those Iraqi museums that got freaking raided and all that stuff from Babylon and and that got stolen away within hours of our freaking first invasion um, you know it, it's not us it's not the American but as long as the American people want to stay complacent and asleep and allow them to continue running us that's that's what it's gonna be but the rest of us we're gonna have to get up off of our asses if we're gonna survive and we're gonna make anything at all we got to take this into our own hands. We got to be responsible for ourselves and our own freedom. Uh, don't ask for permission. Just do it. Uh, um, uh, it. It's your right to do it. You don't need their permission to do it. Uh, whatever you can, start breaking off connections, man. Didn't your parents ever tell you not to hang out with criminals and hoodlums? At, <laughs> you know, or felons like Hillary? Uh, uh, <laughs> you know? Uh, you know, Americans, a lot of Americans are better than that. Not all of us, because we got some of them the programming was just too good or they were just too weak. I'm not going to throw stones, but the fact is, is they're completely under control. They can't see for nothing. You could show them and they still can't see it. They think you're crazy. You know, uh, um, we just, you know, we just got to get to the point where we, we just take responsibility for ourselves. And that's what freedom is, being responsible. It, it sounds like a, 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 
like a mixed signal, you know, responsibility. Freedom, I can do anything I want. Yes, and you can be responsible for it. Exactly, uh, yeah. Well, not stepping on somebody else and you're happy, you're good. And that, that, that's good. Nowadays, though, if you're happy and you're enjoying yourself, it's not good unless the government or the Fed gets a piece of that action of the money involved. And if there's no money involved, you better start charging money because you're going to need it for your permit so, <laughs> so they can tax you. It's a vicious <laughs> circle. You have this transaction. Well, you know, in all of this, and John, you have a theological background. Um, the supernatural evil that has driven this agenda. I mean, certainly since the turn of the 20th century, that first world war set in motion a plan that was outlined by Albert Pike as three world wars. That came from high level Freemasonry. Mm -hmm. It was uh, Albert Pike to Mazzini. So we're talking the lodges in the United States ta talking to the P2 Lodge in Italy. And basically, mm -hmm. this was a global conspiracy that triangulated through the axes of um, Rome, London, and ultimately Washington, D.C., which is now the high city of, of, of satanic worship for the war forces. We became the New World Order's um, yeah, we became their armed forces. It, it, yeah. it, interestingly enough, the three cities, London, City of London, uh, 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 the financial capital of this particular regime we are speaking of, yep. uh, where all the finances are done and taken care of, the spiritual capital, I even hate using that word, where another obelisk is found in St. Peter's Square is the right. Vatican. And then the next place where an obelisk is found, the Washington Monument, is the United States, the military backbone. You know, the free country, nothing free about us. We have been working for the bad guys the whole time. Uh, yeah, Pike was like, 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 what, 1825, early 19th century? Yeah, I think he was reading, he was, yeah. Numbers and one, two, and three. It's funny when you get up to, you know, you say, well, why don't believe in that? That's just conspiracy theory and just wild speculation. And it's kind of, it's funny the people around at the time of World War One decided to name it that. Yeah, <laughs> it was like, a, it was a, well, what do, you, what do you name Mark One if you're not going to have Mark Two, Three, Four, etc.? Yeah. You know, was it was that branding? I mean, you know, we know now that the Pentagon <coughs> uses all of these different think tanks like the Rand Institute to oh, yeah. basically market a war to us. I mean, the first Gulf War, God, you know, that that was marketing on steroids. We had CNN, they blessed oh, yeah. right across the TV screens and we all cheered. Yeah. Myself yeah, and George Bush, Bush hadn't uh, repealed the Truth and Advertising Act, the Department of Defense would be called the Department of Aggression. Exactly, yeah, but no, it's the Department of Peace, the Department of War, it used to be the War Department, then it became the Defense Department. And Pike, Pike goes back to the mid, Pike was writing to both Abraham Lincoln and okay. Karl Marx at the same time. So wow. that, gives you, that gives us an historical setting for this. The wow. letter to Mazzini's probably what, 1871, 1872. Okay. So we're, you know, a quarter of a century out on the 20th century, when all of this is being mapped. Now, it always amazes me how these cabal people are planning generations in advance. You know, and, and quite frankly, that's even modest and conservative. Some of this looks to me like it's got a trajectory of thousands of years in terms of how they've mapped this out, which goes into... What they, it's a definite fingerprint. Uh, or, or, you know, modus operandi of, of a particular cabal, because even in MK Ultra, uh, they 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 use the same the the, the same tactics, uh, in, you know, in, in how they, they program and work. If they, if they had me, they had been working on a generation or two of my family before they even got to right, me. right. And with most of the people that, that we know that they can be vetted, is it's definitely having some genuine experience. Generally, there's more than one generation of their family involved in it before them. Uh, so they, they've always been on the ball. The, the, the Carnegie Institute, those guys, 
at, at, you know, the, the, the robber barons trying to make the public school system. I remember from my grand, grandmother's friends telling me how much they hated the idea of the, being forced to attend a public school because they didn't trust the government. And then the government went and got truant officers that would start, this is you know, early 1900s, at, uh, uh, would be patrolling the streets, looking for kids walking the street during a school day and pick them up and there'd be all kinds of problems and eventually everybody started accepting the public school system. They weren't teaching, they were indoctrinating people to work in their own factories. And they were in charge of this and they were using that Prussian formula. I tell you, when these guys get a hold of a formula that works, they never vary from it. They might change a name or something here or there. But the formula, yeah. false flags we've seen, same lame ass excuses and patsies and stuff all involved the same way and they like i say they do it the same it's it's, it's like the like i say the mo if you were a detective you'd say ah the game is afoot dr moriarty strikes again you know, <laughs> uh, uh, you know the dastardly bastard blew off a bomb at a marathon and now a whole city's under martial law you know troops checking house to house things that are against our law so much that other people used to get hung for this stuff so, you know, my sense of this has been, and, and the longer I'm digging into all of it, the profiling that's been done, and feel free to disagree on this, but I've come to the conclusion, the profiling was based on genetics. It was based on something that we were that distinguished us, and it's also based on uh, something that we walked into, and it struck me when Bear was talking about the fact that, because I'd not heard this before, where an adopted child was the designated one. Now, that sounds a lot to me like targeting mm -hmm. in some way. In other words, what circumstances are arranged in order for Bear to be born and then adopted out into a family? who are triangulated into the satanic cabal and then used in a project like MK Ultra. And where I'm going, I guess, with this is we seem to have a fingerprint that supersedes the, the physical realm. Mm -hmm. that, that, that I guess where I'm going with this is the wiping and recycling of souls and how there is, a, there is an MK Ultra that occurs between lives as well. And I'm, and I'm talking here about, you know what I'm talking about, probably can describe it. But it's something I've been looking into a, a very long time, especially even as a witch, and just growing up as, a, as an old soul in this particular time mm -hmm. and age. I know this is, this is what's keeping people back and what's what's been stunting the majority of the human species the human souls uh it's not going to work and it's not going to work on me and a great many others i know no. this time around i know others have broken free of it uh um and i anticipate in fact i am anticipated <laughs> that I will break free of it this time around. When my yes, time comes, yes, that's where I was going. You walked yeah, right, thank you. We, will, we yeah. will evolve, we will start growing. Out of 64 possible combinations of chromosomes that could be turned on in the human genome, most of humanity has only 20 of them turned right. on. Uh, people like us that have been genetically messed with and picked out, you know, uh, there's a genetic anomaly. It's mostly noticeable in dogs, all right? They have a certain set of base pairs of chromosomes, which allows us this great elasticity. We're looking at a Mexican hairless, mm -hmm. a Chihuahua, a Poodle, a Pekingese, a Dachshund, a Great Dane, a German Shepherd, a Mastiff. Every one of them are canines. Every one of them are dogs. Every one of them has a dog's nature, but they are vastly different in how they look and how they operate. It's that, that malleability of those base pairs of chromosomes. 
Yeah, interestingly enough, too, someone once mentioned in, a, in an article uh, uh, that they were doing about all the different breeds of dogs that dog is God spelled backwards. Yeah. The people on the earth have been arguing about the genetic type yeah. of diversity. Things that have, who's God? What's God? Small g, all right, that, that interfered and made Cro Magnon, you know, because it's going to take several missing links in order to get from. Neanderthal to this, or, or, or you know, from this kind of hominid to this kind of hominid. This kind of hominid with a chest that flails this way to make up for the large arms. Yeah. Now we have a hominid like me whose chest flails this way. Uh, you know, completely different skeletal structure. The head, right. everything's completely yeah. different. Somebody interfered, all right? Somebody got in and started playing with the base pairs of chromosomes. Now Lloyd Pye showed an interesting thing in one of his examples of showing a gorilla and a chimpanzee and a human being and where it looked like the, the chromosomes were spliced. Somebody did this to, mm -hmm. we did this to dogs, somebody did this to us. Now there's an ultimate, uh, I've gone beyond that in some of my other videos, yeah, but uh, people are wondering who to call that God, who to call daddy. Uh, they don't know where they come from and everything that they've been told about where they come from. And, and I, been really noted for its accuracy. <laughs> you know, if anything, the other way around, because knowledge is power, and keeping somebody in the dark is also power for the person owning the slaves. Yeah, and unfortunately, Lloyd Pye seems to have been somewhat unceremoniously terminated as well with his research. I mean, he was... Uh, yeah, he had, he had, I loved his presentation. I did too. He actually yeah. got scientific about it and, you know, used empirical data, the fossil record and everything to make his points. Yeah, I don't make it dangerous in this way too. But it never made any sense, you know, as to what they were saying. It never connected. Well, there's a missing link somewhere. We're sure to find it someday. We never have. Uh, and we never have found a whole lot of other uh, inter- mediary species between a lot of other things that were supposed to have evolved from something else entirely. Right, um, right, yeah. You know, I mean, that, that never really fully held water, and that's what we were being taught. That's what we were being indoctrinated in. But I think these others, this cabal, they know better. They know different. They have some kind of contact with at least some of these things. Um, you know, and there's something going on, and they don't want to admit it, but then again, if, uh, if Richard Helms our names and everything didn't destroy so many of our MK Ultra file. There's a whole lot of people where if there was justice, look, there's no, there's no statute of limitations for the things they did to us children. That's right. All right, all that got murdered. Some of these people would be serving like multiple life sentences, if not the death penalty, for what they did to us and are continuing to do even now. At, uh, um, so that's not going to come up that way. There's no way they're going to willingly get up off of their thrones, you know, start walking past them peaceably towards the gallows or the jail. You know, we're going to have to do something. That's why what you guys are doing right now is so important. This is the testimony. Is right. it empirical? Does it present evidence? Well, the preponderance of evidence is in the witness and testimony of the people who are coming forward in the corroboration. You know, each time one of you connects with another one of you and brings forth a little bit more of the overlap, we are a panel that's hearing the testimony of what this is all about and why, why MK Ultra was so pervasive. You know, yeah. you were talking earlier about public schools, and it's not lost on me that public schools were also a means for them to target as well. You know, Duncan's talked about Project Talent, and Project Talent was actually several different projects, one of which was a public side Project Talent that a lot of us have talked about encountering when we were in school in the 60s and the 70s, where uh -huh. you were tested for exceptional abilities and then basically taken into, let's just say, outside programs. Yeah. And a lot of those back then, 67, 68, I remember doing the uh, cards and, you know, ESP stuff uh, right. at the University of Rochester. But SRI and, uh, and I think even Duke University had uh, a part in some of those studies. In 67, already, 
Russia was noted to be spending 70 million rubles a year back then, that was big money, on the psychic warfare, the remote viewing and stuff. And this was spurning them. By 70, by 1970, you got Angel Swan, but things were even before Swan got there. Swan gets a lot of credit for, for what went on. But they were already, you know, years into to studying a couple, you know, some of the effects of this, but they were looking for a little more structure. They were, you know, you're, you're, you're teaching yourself, you know, after you have a stroke, you got to teach your hand to work again. And they're kind of right. teaching themselves how to do this stuff. So they were finding things that they liked better. Uh, uh, got a little more control over. Um, I remember when when I first started doing it, we were doing a sensory deprivation tank, and essentially I wasn't remote viewing so much as astral projecting. But I got more information. It was like being there, you know, like the ghost of a living man. It was terrific. I not only knew who was there, what they looked like, what they were doing, what they were talking about. I was so close I could feel what they were feeling you know, as they were talking yeah. about it. And uh, it seemed like after Swan and, and later on in later years, I wouldn't blame Swan for it, but uh, that they got more and more compartmentalized where they start doing this, this pinging thing. I, I call it pinging. It's like sonar. It's where you know they, they take a template of questions and ask, okay, here's the coordinates. Tell me, uh, is, it, is it urban or rural? The first thing that comes to your mind, ping, you, know, you send out this questioning thought, ping, urban or rural? Mm -hmm. It's rural. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, Always trust the first impression. Right. Yeah. And, and, but essentially, they take all those answers. Now, you as the remote viewer would not be the one. What did you just look at? What did you just see at this coordinates? You don't know. You just know the individual words. You had a data so, point. They so were. The an analyst sits down and says, okay, we got two buildings on, an er on a rural thing. One's a white house, one's a red barn, yada, yada, yada. Here we got, you know, so we're going to put this report together as to what it is. But the remote viewer is so compartmentalized, like I say, mm -hmm. sometimes I think they get in their own way with their secrecy. Uh, they get into trouble, you know, you start lying so much you can't remember what you said last. <laughs> in terms of sensory deprivation, obviously the most well-known are the large tanks. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, people have just recently in the, over the summer watched Stranger Things and saw the sensory depri deprivation tanks. Oh, yeah, like the one she had, yeah, mine was different. Yeah, was, was I'm more wondering like, more about isolation techniques that were used for sensory deprivation, but also activating triggers. Yep. using sound and light in a sensory deprivation environment. Is that something right. that you can speak to? Yeah, it's much richer in the tank. Uh, for me, I wasn't fully immersed. I was laying on top. It's kind of like picture of very large mm -hmm. coffin looking thing with a hatch on top. Right, yeah. There. Uh, it's salt water. It's about 98.6 degrees. It's dark. It's got kind of a funny chemical smell to it. It's not a comfortable place, but it, it can be, but it's just unnatural. Uh, but you kind of get in there and after a while you kind of forget, you know, that, that you're in a box and closed in and you're like floating weightlessly and then the doctor's voice will come over with a speaker and say, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna look at this place and that, what do you see? And since you've got nowhere to go, nothing to feel, you, you, you're looking for input somewhere. Your, your body, your mind, your soul, I don't know. It's like, it's like it's straining for information because there's no information in this mm -hmm, box. Mm -hmm. so it's all outside the box. So you go to it. You just, up, oh, gone. It, I, I always found that amazing. I remember like flying, I mean jetting through this big tube and just knowing where to make a right turn or turn down to be where it is I got to go. It's just I can't imagine how that is possible, but that's what it seems like every time, you know. Next time I come out of this tube and I'm in the air, like over the middle of Australia and coming down closer and closer, and I'm seeing what I'm seeing, you know, air's rock or something like that, and, and yeah. then I get close, land on it, see people, whatever, describe what I see, and generally it's accurate. Um, you know, if somebody's there on the site, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll say, and that was what our remote viewing was like in around 67, 68, around there. 
Uh, and we had some really good results with it, but like I said, the Russians were already, they, America was already behind and worried because the Russians were already spending 70 million rubles a year back then for those. And, uh, and that's where mine kind of went, and I think that's where they start revolving me off the super soldier. They tried me for MK Monarch, but I'm not that kind of person that could be a celebrity or an icon or something, too violent. Um, but at the same point, I can remote view and do the martial arts so I can hunt and seek. Made an excellent super soldier for him for the time. <laughs> Bear, do you have anything to, to enter into that uh, in terms of any kind of psychic training or what you may remember about being tested, profiled, or specific skills that you felt that they had honed in on you in that area as well? Well, it's interesting. I don't, I don't have the immediate recall that John and Duncan have as far as martial arts training, but it's very obvious when uh, Duncan and I were together we got in the backyard and we were doing a few things and it was just one of those things where I picked up the boat on, I picked up the nunchucks, bam, bam, thank you, ma'am, here it is. It's as if I had just been stopped doing it yesterday when it's been years ago that I actually remember having these tools at my disposal to use. Mm -hmm. uh, just recently, as a matter of fact, <clears throat> um, my wife got a trainer butterfly knife that she had ordered for herself. I picked the thing up in, in less than two minutes. Here I am working it as if it was no, nothing. It's just second nature for me. So that kind of thing was confirmation along with discussions that I've had with Storm and, and Duncan both, as well as Dave Corso. You know, these are things that, you know, are gonna come back to you. As you get, as, you, as you're presented with the tools, if you act, if, if this was a truth, if this was a reality, it'll be just like riding a bicycle. You may fall down a couple of times, but basically you're going to be able to pick up the bicycle and ride as if you were been doing it all your life. And that's been my case. Past projection, the way Storm was just describing, I was sitting here as you guys were talking about it. Yeah, I can recall that the, the, the closest thing I can give to, to describe to somebody who's doing this show right now is that. Uh, the sci-fi descriptions that they give you visually in the movies and in the TV programs where you're seeing the tunnel as it's going through and, and you're the one going through the tunnel and you come out at a, a point A, point B, wherever it is and being able to, to very accurately down to the most minuscule uh, item like uh, what, the, what the individual is wearing for their attire and then being uh, shown live video feed of what this person was actually wearing and you describe it down to its finest detail. The black tie, blue suit, with red shoes with white shoelaces. Literally. And uh, it, it, it's an amazing thing. It was an amazing gift to, to, to be given and have in the home. I haven't used those tools since. Uh, last time Duncan was in town and we were together, we, we did bring out a map and I was able for the first time to actually sit down and he was giving, we were, we were doing the coordinate thing and being able to pinpoint where an, a specific individual was at the time for a specific reason for our, our own purposes. And it turns out that it was accurate within six meters. So the skill set is still there. Yeah. Um, and these are things that they compartmentalize inside of a, a separate personality, which is since slowly began to integrate more into my core personality and i'm now at a place where i'm starting to feel more and more comfortable picking up those tools again and using them for my goals my my needs my goals, my instead of being used as a tool for the powers of be i'm now going to turn and use this tool set against them and uh yeah if they're shaking in their boots they should be they, they damn well should be because it's not a good thing to have a caged animal all of a sudden no longer be caged and able to fend and feed for, feed and feed for themselves. What I call owning your own ultra. <laughs> you know, and it, it's been a real gift and a real blessing the way things have turned out to having Storm here with me now. And, uh, you know, there, there's daily, we have, it, it, you'd be amazed at some of the discussions that we have to sit around drinking a cup of coffee. And we're just talking, you know, and 
that's kind of how the healing process has been for us both, especially me. I, I'm not going to speak for, for John, but I'm sure it's the same way. Um, just sitting down and having a nice caval ca casual cavalier conversation and we able to laugh and be a little bit jovial about some of the things. And there's some things that come up and he knows when he spots it in me, he can tell that, you know, he's, the nerves been struck and so we back off a bit a little bit closer mm -hmm. and, and stuff like that. But um, it's just an ongoing process and I don't see an ending to it. It's just the layers of the onion that are going to continue to be peeled. And with each process it goes through, there's, a, there's pain involved, there's, but there's also a relief that I can't describe properly for anybody to be able to understand. It's something you have to live and go through. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for, for, for being able to have that at this point. You know, it's, it's a real gift. I'm, you know, we were talking about this earlier today about, uh, had it not been for that incident in 2003, where would I be? Would I even still be here? Or would I be in a shallow grave at this point? Or would I still be being used? Because as early as 2003, honestly, I was, I was still activated, programmed, completely indoctrinated, you know, for all intents and purposes, a robot with um, no recollection or, or and no remorse, no empathy, no anything. It's just, here's a job, here's a mission, go do the mission. That's the end of it, and you know the person would be laying there bleeding in front of me, and I'm eating spaghetti dinner as if it's nothing. You know, uh, thankfully, it's not that way for me now. Now, now it's a personal choice. It's a conscious decision, and ultimately, you know, like we, you guys were already talking about in this discussion. Now, uh, you know, change is coming, and unfortunately, it's going to be very painful for the cabal. And rightfully so, they, they, they deserve it. Yeah, they're not I feel gonna, real fucking uh, sorry for them right now, frankly. Yeah. They're not going to go off quietly into the sunset. As much as I honestly do wish that they would, it would make it a lot easier for the rest of us. But if they're going to stand and fight, understand we are too. And uh, it's, it's not going to go easy. And mostly it's not going to go easy for them. It was kind of the reason why I wanted, you know, at, at certain points to kind of bring it into the spiritual side of this, because I sense the energies of the times. I sense that, as John was talking about earlier, I'm not coming back here again to do this. We've been in a spin cycle, you know, we've been split, we've been used, we've been wiped, shot out the tube, brought back in the other side, and the whole thing started again. And one of the things that I get from people that I talk to a lot is a sense of this is the final cycle. We're going to resolve this one way or another. There's a war of two worlds going on. Yeah, the line's definitely been drawn yeah. in the sand, and this is it. This is the final battle. So how it plays out, you know, we're going to just have to wait and see how that, how that works out. Uh, but I've got, I've got hope. I've got, I've got hope that... Uh, Absolutely. You know, and that's what keeps me going. That's what drives me motivates me to get out of bed every day um yep that well a cup of coffee you know yeah. but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so i'd like to try to end this a little bit on a on a more, more positive note because i know it's gotten pretty heavy tonight so take it for what it's worth and uh, let's get on with the business of getting on and make it happen absolutely Guys, I can't thank you enough for coming on and having what I consider to be an epic conversation. John, it's been too long. Bear, it's been too long. <laughs> well, then we'll have to definitely do this again real soon. We are. The plan is that hopefully the next time we'll get something together, either, um, either in your environment or somewhere, and get Duncan pulled in and we can go another level. Um, I just really appreciate the transparency, Bear. You, you, I know you've struggled with, with doing this for quite a while. We've talked about this for what, probably close to a year. And this isn't something you do lightly. And it's not something that I push people into. I, this isn't, as I said earlier, this isn't tabloid. This is about keeping it real and making sure that you're comfortable and what you put out to this audience and to the people that will hopefully see and hear this 
is something that they can take away from that will inspire them and will move this whole process forward because that's really what we're talking about. Any, any last words from you there, John? Anything else you want to you want to say before we duck out of here? Before, for better times, I'm surviving. Actually, yes. a little better than surviving. We're trying some different medical techniques and, 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 and medicines to try to deal with some of the man-made side effects that I got to deal with now. And we are seeing some positive effects. So uh, I'm in a position now where I'm not just surviving up there and just to help me. No, you're looking strong there, brother. You are. You know, no matter what, I got to be with somebody somewhere. Um, and, it, and it's been good for me. And, and like I say, I may be doing better than surviving. I may be. I'd, be, I'd love not having seizures a year or so. Uh, that would be great. And it, and it looks like it's doable. I mean, and if you don't mind this. right now, we'd like to self-promote the website just a little bit. Go and for I'm it. Doing, yeah, we don't charge money for what we do. Right. Uh, it, it's work from the heart, and you, you pay for what you get. But if you're interested in following up, you want to know more about me, the lodge is at uh, rpmlmedicinelodge.org. And just look it up. Look up the website. You can read what the ceremonies are all about, what I'm all about. And uh, we're available whenever, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. This is what we do. Yep. You know? We'll put that link up with the show. John, you have a YouTube channel, right? Oh, yeah. Storm 53. Storm 53 at YouTube.com. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll, connect, we'll, we'll connect over with that. All the links will be there. We're going to wrap it up for this time. Um, I, I think this was a real, real amazing time that we spent together, guys. Um, so we'll, we'll put the lid on it here. This is All Planet TV. I'm Randy Moggins. The truth is out there. It really is out there. And we'll be back with another show real soon. Thanks, guys. Good night. All right, you have a good one.